Hi everyone. Lots of us love to spend time at the coast. In fact, last year, 135 million days were spent as tourists on our coastline. And why not? It's fantastic time to spend some time with fantastic place, sorry, to spend some time with friends and family, explore nature and get some exercise. However, our sand dunes are more than just a tourist attraction. They're also a fantastic defense against coastal erosion and coastal flooding, protecting those communities <coughs> that live behind them. A really good example of this is here at Ainsdale Beach, just north of Liverpool. You can see here that this is a sand dune that's recently been eroded. So large waves combined with a high tide is taken away the front of that dune, but it's protected everything that it's behind it. Coastal sand dunes are amazing and that this dune will actually, under normal conditions, naturally repair itself as well. So that sediment that's currently stored offshore will move onshore, so towards the land during um, small wave conditions. It will then dry out on the beach and winds coming from the sea moving in towards the land will blow that sediment on towards the dunes and build them back up again. Our sand dunes are also a really important economic and recreational resource as well. If you think around the British Isles, how many famous golf courses are situated within our sand dunes? And if you go to somewhere like Northwest Ireland, the vast majority of recreation pitches are also in places like County Donegal are situated on our sand dunes. Some sand dunes are a tourist attraction in themselves. The Dune de Pile here in France attracts tens of thousands of people to hike up to the top of it and enjoy the scenery that's around them. Today, however, we're going to be mainly talking about coastal dunes as an ecological resource. And this image from North Morpha Dufferin in North Wales really demonstrates why. Within this one picture, you can see a myriad of habitats. You can see bare sand, which is almost like a desert, dry and easily moves around. You can see grassland, which offers different patches of shade and different habitats within it. You can see shrubs, which will grow into mature trees. And then you can see these ponds. These are called dune slacks. These are ephemeral ponds that fill up with rainwater in winter and spring and then dry out over the summer. And this diverse range of habitats also supports a diverse range of species. Everything from lizards, such as sand lizards, amphibians called natterjack toads, which live in those dune slacks, as well as over 400 vascular plants and loads and loads of invertebrates, such as solitary bees, which burrow into those loose bits of sand. However, this diverse image of a sand dune is decreasing in the United Kingdom and throughout the world. Increasingly, our sand dunes are becoming greener and greener, and those patches of bare sand and dune slack are disappearing. So why is that? What's going on? Well, first of all, we're living in a changing climate. Our world is becoming generally, well, certainly in Northwest Europe, warmer and wetter. And that increases the amount of growing time in the growing season that these plants can then colonize and take over those patches of bare sand. Throughout the world over the last 70 years as well, it's generally becoming less windy. And so there's less opportunity for that bare sand to be blowing around, creating that disturbance in the habitat, which creates that vast mosaic of habitats that we saw in the last image. Within the UK, there's also been a catastrophic decline in grazing pressure in the last 70 years. So for several centuries, things like rabbits have eaten and grazed within the war, within sand dunes and taken away lots of that young vegetation, allowing a diversity of vegetation and the diversity of landscape to exist within it. However, with the introduction of maximatosis in the 1950s, that rabbit, that, rabbit uh, that rabbit population catastrophically declined and that grazing pressure was removed from the dunes. Some areas of the UK also suffer from invasive and exotic species, either escaping for, from gardens and taking over the sand dunes or being planted within them to try and stabilize them and stop them from moving around. So what's been the result of this dramatic change in bare sand in our sand dunes throughout the United Kingdom over the last 70 years? Well, lots of our rare plants and invertebrates have declined and some species have been lost completely. In the UK, however, there is a legal obligation to try and maintain those rare species or increase them. And some would argue there's also a moral obligation to do that as well. One way we're doing that is to try and artificially recreate those disturbances that happen. So one of the ways is by taking large machinery and scraping some of that top layer of vegetation off, allowing winds to come in, pick up that sand and blow it elsewhere. Another measure is what they've done here in Newborough Warren on Anglesey is to actually cut and punch a hole through the foraging and allow nutrient poor sediment so to be blown in from the beach through this gap in the dunes and then blow into the hinterland behind it, as you can see here. 
and that creates, as you can see, a bit more diversity in the habitat that's there. There are, however, some locations that are bucking this global trend. They're literally going against it, where across the world we've seen a general greening of dunes. There are some locations in the United Kingdom that these mobile dunes are actually still increasing and growing. And it's these exceptions to the rule that are really, really interesting to us as scientists. What's going on at these locations that dune mobility is not only still happening, but it's actually increasing? With this information, can we then help those land managers and help those interventions be more sustainable and help create that diversity within these landscapes? So the first thing we have to do is actually quantify the amount of sand that's in these dunes. And as you can imagine, it's just not feasible to go around and survey every single bare patch of sand within a sand dune. So instead, we've taken to the skies. Initially, through satellite data, we've analysed the amount of bare sand. More recently, using aerial photography that's been flown from planes. And now, the state of the art, using unmanned aerial vehicles as drones. We fly these at only four or five minutes above the dune. We get a really high resolution image of how much bare sand and habitat is within it. So once we've identified where that bare sand is, the next job as a scientist is to try and understand what is driving it. What environmental factors are causing that bare sand to happen in that location? And the first thing that we're looking at is wind speeds at the location. And it's not feasible to go out with anemometers and cover the entire landscape with, with measuring devices. So instead, we're numerically modeling that wind speed. So we're using a bit of software called computational fluid dynamics. And this is most commonly used to design Formula One cars and jet planes. And we're using it to model wind flow over dunes. However, what it does give us is a really high resolution of wind speed and turbulence at centimetre scale and a really high accuracy across an entire landscape. So we have that one layer. Another layer that we use is elevation and slope. And we put all these different layers together and then try to st statistically predict where those locations for mobile sand are. If we can identify those environmental drivers that help bear sand and mobile sand occur, then hopefully we can spread that information and give it to the land managers who are making those interventions. The hope is that they can make them in strategic places where they're most likely to be sustainable and they're not going to have to be topped up and frequently gone back to and removed from that vegetation. Overall, we hope to create a landscape that is a benefit to people, can be utilised by people and enjoyed by people, but in which also nature can thrive and survive. Thank you very much.